Heritage International Headquarters in Fort Mill, South Carolina. This is Prophetic Perspectives on Current Events with Rick Joyner. Welcome to Prophetic Perspectives on Current Events. Welcome our Facebook Live. Those who are joining us from Facebook and also Spirit Fuel Ministries. We don't just kill two birds with one stone. We kill three. And uh, so we're doing three things together now and uh, got a bunch of questions in already. We want to talk about some of the major events going on. But first thing I want to discuss, which was the question Spirit Fuel Ministries had submitted about, you know, a prophetic perspective concerning the nations for 2017. And um, now I think generally, uh, obviously, America has made a significant turn uh, back to the right. I think that's happening around the world. But what does that mean? I, you know, it's something I've been saying for a couple of years now that I think I was shown back in uh, 2014, actually, um, that patriotism is going to win. Um, that is, you know, if it wins, to me, it wins without going to the extreme. You know, I think uh, patriotism is is a good thing, like everything kept in balance. Uh, extreme nationalism can get things really out of whack. Anything taken to an extreme can uh, get wacky. But um, I think it's a God thing. I think the patriotism rising up in the nations is truly something from God because he is the one who, it says, gave his, he gave us the nations and he set their boundaries. So, uh, you know, that we have nations and that they have borders is from God. In fact, there is a major curse that comes upon those who would move the ancient boundaries. We can't let that happen. So, um, you know, I think it's a right thing that people were saying, wait a minute, we're going to have borders. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't like people on the other side of that border or don't like the nations around you or whatever. If someone said, you know, the reason I lock my door at night, it's not because I hate people that are outside, but it's because I love the ones who are inside. And I think we have to do that. You know, a lot of people were, it's amazing to me, the very ones who are saying we're no longer a Christian nation and are attacking Christ and Christianity all the time are saying it's unchristian to ban immigrants. Oh, really? And I understand they're saying Jesus was once a refugee, and you could say that. And I think a lot of really outstanding people are, brothers and sisters in Christ. But the thing is, why were they kept out of our country under the Obama administration? An estimated 90,000 Christians were martyred and not allowed into this country. Only Muslims were let in. Christians were banned. Why, didn't, why was there no outrage about that? Well, I think we're starting to get some, and we're starting to see how badly we needed to change directions. But I think we do have to do it in the right spirit, and we do have to keep in mind that uh, the foreigner or the sojourner, how we treat them is very critical, and it is even uh, directly related to how we are considered to have treated Christ himself. And when they, the nations were divided into sheep or goat nations, and um, he says, you know, the distinguishing characteristic that made a nation a sheep nation rather than a goat nation was that the sheep were the ones when he was thirsty, they gave him drink. When he was hungry, they gave him food. And he says, when I was a foreigner, you took me in. Now, I think one of the reasons America has been so blessed is because we've been one of the best nations to do that. There are many great nations who have taken in many refugees, who have taken in many immigrants who've been built on immigration. America's truly a nation made up from all the nations that have come together to make up America. We have great populations from virtually every nation. And we appreciate that. It brings something to it. It makes us who we are. Uh, it's a diversity that we can, you know, I think should richly appreciate. And, 
and honor. But, you know, there's also other scriptures. And you know how a lot of people who really don't read the Bible and claim that certain things are in it, <laughs> you know, usually don't know what they're talking about. Or they'll only use one scripture that is an extreme and not use the counterbalancing ones. But I think, you know, we've got to, as a nation, continue to allow immigration. Some of our best people coming in now uh, are immigrants, and they, they, they are doing such a wonderful job. They're incredible people, incredible workers. And many of those I'm talking about are illegal immigrants who I think we've got to work out a way to help them to get in. And I, I, I think part of the reason that they couldn't get in was our immigration system is so broken. It needs fixing too. But that being said, I think it's right that we know who is in our country. How would you like if someone knocked on your door and said, I'm coming to live with you. I want you to take care of me, feed me, take care of all my medical bills. I'm gonna raise my family here in your home and uh, you're gonna pay for it all. Now, how would you react to that? It was interesting to me how some of the demonstrators against the immigration uh, ban that, uh, not ban, it was a, a halt, a temporary halt put on seven nations where it was uh, determined that there were seriously radicalized people trying to get into our nation from those countries. And we didn't have a way of vetting those who were coming from those countries. So I think the only wise thing you could do is stop it. But some of the demonstrators were out there demonstrating. I, I saw last night where um, a reporter was going around, well, are you, you willing to take immigrants into your home? Are you willing to take care of them? And they were, oh, no way. You know, all of a sudden, they saw it from a whole different side. And many of them, it was interesting, did not even know why they were out there demonstrating. Someone had paid them or they had just gotten up with the crowd. We see that happening in the book of Acts. But this is a time of that. This is a time when some ultimate issues are being uh, challenged. Some ultimate issues are being resolved, I think. And I think every time we have a challenge to one, it's also an, a time that we can resolve it. It's coming out into the light so we can see it. And... Uh, so I think this is a year we're going to see that continue to happen. I think we're going to see it continue to happen for some time into the future because there are a lot of things that need to be worked out. And um, I think America especially is a nation that we are called to be a nation divided. Now, I know our name is United States, and I know in many ways, the basic ways, we must be united as Americans, but I think there are many ways we're supposed to be divided. We're supposed to be a place where ultimate issues can be addressed, debated. I think it's a place where freedom was provided for that and where these things can be debated openly. And hopefully in due time, it's going to be without the shrillness that's going on right now that is pretty bizarre. But I think, you know, that's just a part of our calling. Let's get used to it. Let's let's get excited about it. And let's don't run from the issues that make people passionate. First, let's find out why are you so passionate? What is it that offends you about this? Often you find out they've got misconceptions. They had terrible misconceptions about, you know, Trump's uh, immigration a stop on those seven countries. I mean, they blew that way out of proportion. And I mean, you've got to be really dull not to understand how the media is doing that now. I mean, it's gone more extreme than other than ever. And uh, almost daily, they're putting out things. And as I've said, if you really want to discern the facts, you can pretty much be right if you just take what the media is saying and believe the opposite. It's really gotten that bad. Uh, they have such a knee-jerk reaction to a uh, to make the worst out of anything coming out of the Trump White House or conservatives, the media. Now, there's some media out there that are doing an outstanding job. There's plenty out there that do the same from the right. 
as those who are doing it from the left. But I think we're supposed to be that place where the debate goes on. And hopefully we can rise to a place of just dealing with these things with better manners and intelligence. But we're, we're also fighting some things spiritually. And, uh, you know, one thing that we're fighting right now, and I think our life depends on us winning this fight, is what I call the bully spirit. That's a simplification. But it's a lot of it, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton counted one of her mentors, Saul Alinsky, who wrote the book Rules for Radicals. And I encourage you to read it. I read it a couple of summers ago. I think I'd read it many years before that, but I read it again. And uh, now one thing that's interesting to me, very first page, he dedicates that book. Saul Alinsky dedicates that book to Lucifer, the first rebel, <laughs> the first, you know, who started the first rebellion. That book's dedicated to Satan. That should give you pause. And, but this, these are the methods, and it is the strategy being used by the left right now. Now, I think plenty on the right have done that, but mostly in the past. I don't see that happening on the right at this time. Maybe it's because they've won and are winning, but it's not legitimate. And uh, But the strategy of the bully spirit is to shout down your opposition so nobody can hear them. So nobody can hear you. If that doesn't work, it's to intimidate you. Cause you to be fearful that if you say something, they're just going to blow up and they're going to call you a racist. Listen, if you're not called a racist in these days, you're probably not doing anything. You probably cease to live. Because uh, everybody gets called a racist. Everybody gets called a bigot. Everybody gets called intolerant. And in my opinion, we probably all dealing with dealing with things in those areas. And, uh, you know, but there's, a, you know, I think, you know, right now, uh, and it's been this way for since the founding of our country and maybe always, but... Um, little political science mixed in with prophecy. During the Revolutionary War, 30% of Americans were liberal. 30% were conservative. 40% were in the middle and could swing either way, depending on who was winning. It hasn't changed since then. Maybe a point or two here and there, but it is basically the same. 30% are diehard liberals you're not going to change their mind. And the only reason politicians are always speaking to their base, trying to excite their base, it's not to win them over. They've already got them. They're not going to lose them, but they've got to get them excited enough to actually go to the polls and vote, to care enough to vote. And uh, so th that's why both side have, sides have to speak to their base. But the most elections, if not all of them, are won by reaching the 40 percent who are in the middle and could go either way. So um, now that being said, um, you know, the shrillness, most people actually still vote based on emotions more than facts or policies or things like that. Not saying that's right, and it's certainly not all people, but it is actually most in the studies that have even been done up to recently. Most people, if they don't like somebody or they heard they did something or if you were wounded in some area, if, you know, uh, and then that person is accused of being that way, you know, it can affect your vote. And uh, Winston Churchill once said that, you know, the greatest case against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. We're not educated like we would in the real facts and hearsay. You see, um, but that that is the state we're in, and most people are responding to emotion, and their emotions are touched and excited by extreme statements. And uh, that's why a lot of this is going on. 
But the uh, the Saul Alinsky methods can only work for so long. After a while, people start wising up to those. And then they start becoming counterproductive. And you're going to see this happen right now with those who are using, they're already losing market share big time in the 40%, in the independents, in the people in the middle, um, who are just offended by the tone. Now, that used to be the conservatives, the Republican side. And they were right. The tone was terrible. And I'm not saying there's not still a lot of bad tone and outright, you know, outrageous things being said. There are. And we got to do better. But right now, the the left is owning it. And I think it's hurting them bad. Now, my point is, I don't think we want them hurt. Not as bad as they're getting hurt. I think America has made it. This is a prophecy. I think America has made a turn back to the right, and it's not going to go back to the extreme left. I don't think it's going to do that. What we've got to guard against is going too far to the right now. And we may overcorrect a little bit until we get back on course. But, you know, the path of life is between two ditches. You know, there's a ditch on either side of the path of life. And I think often if you fall into one ditch, you overreact and and then cross the path of, of life and go into the ditch on the other side. We don't want to do that. I think there is a real danger that we do that. So, but, you know, I think America's turned back. I think we're turning back towards economic stability and strength. And I think it can be continuing. And I think it could bring about the longest and most substantial time of prosperity and wealth that we've ever had in our history. Um, now, you, I've also been predicting other th things too. I, we're on the we're still tottering on the edge of an economic collapse worldwide. A number of things could set that off. I think the most dangerous of which is where China is tottering economically. And there are some just serious dangers there that could drag the whole world down. After that, it would be the EU and Europe and things going on there. There are a lot of things. Can, but right now, America, just since Donald Trump's election and the strengthening of the stock market and the liquidity that is now back in our country and the strength of the dollar, we would actually be in a place where we could help the nations avoid a major worldwide economic collapse because of something real bad happening in the Chinese economy, the EU or something else. We're in a place to stabilize the whole world for a time where it would be bad, but it would not be as bad and it wouldn't bring that ultimate collapse. I see that as grace from God. And um, so, yeah, I think I'm praying for China. I think China has done some major things uh, really well in, in starting their market economy off and they've done some things. They've left some holes. They've left some, you know, areas where I think they could get severely hurt with a economic tragedy. But I think also they'll get back on their feet and they'll right the ship and maybe be damaged and limping along for a while. We'll have learned some things. The Chinese are good at learning. And uh, I think they're, they're going to uh, see where actually – a lot of the centralized planning of the old communist order just does not work with the free market. They got to work out that issue. They got to work out their accounting policies and things like that. But, but they're going to go through some things, that, but it doesn't have to drag the whole world down. I think before this election, it would have dragged the whole world down. I think God has given us again. He's given us more grace, more time. And we're in a position we can stand up and, and help steady the nations.